welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics. Uh, this is our very first official show. We did a pretend show before, but we weren't as um, amazing then as we intend to be this evening. Today I have my lovely enchanting panel. We have Joe Steigerwald, who, uh, let's see, what's his introduction? He's the technical mind behind the Stag blog, for which we both blog. Um, say hi to the people, Joe. Hello, people, Joe. We have Michelle Montalvo, who is, she, she told me she's a perpetual intern and a sci-fi enthusiast, and that seems to be a perpetually useful tagline. Say hi, Michelle. Hello. I'm just a common white girl. <laughs> and we have Corey Massimino, a resident filthy communist and Godzilla and pizza aficionado, which literally sums up every facet of his personality. All right. Um, a lot of, honestly, a lot of important shit happened this week, and a lot of it for libertarians was really bad news. Um, like, for example, today, uh, the totally toothless NSA bill passed, and without Justin Amash, our libertarian friend in Congress, is, uh, vote yes, because that's how toothless it became, and that sucks. But, okay, the first thing I want to talk about, though, was um, on May 19th, Gren, bleh, Gren Greenwald, no, Gren Gre Greenwald, I got it. Glenn Greenwald and his Intercept outfit um, published a brand new Edward Snowden in, um, Snowden leak turned into article, a couple of memos with it as well. And what it came down to was basically the entirety of the Bahamas is having their phone calls recorded by the NSA. Um, and they supposedly keep the calls for a month. And the thing about this is that it's not actually metadata. You know, we all got used to metadata and being scared of metadata. Everyone in the world can now define metadata. They're actually recording um, content, like like phone call content for this, which is, you know, a whole other thing. Um, I read the piece and I was really creeped out. I guess general comments on the piece and more leaks. The, the usual cast of NSA characters, do we have thoughts? Anyone? Michelle, you love Edward Snowden more than anyone in the world. I do. I wish, um, I think that same piece mentioned that there, um, you know, U.S. citizens are, you know, fall victim to this because I think five million plus visit the Bahamas every year and that Oprah and a few others have homes there. I wish, uh, I wish this tracking would have kept, uh, would have made us privy to Oprah releasing like a chai tea through Starbucks. Like I, I wish we had stopped that before it happened. Um, kind of avoided that, but I don't know. There's, there's, I mean, it was creepy to read and I know that there are issues now as far as the Bahamas, the, that they obviously released the, that the Bahamas, all the phone calls are being um, collected and you can like up to a month or so, I think you can mm. replay them back, uh, which is creepy, but now there's issue with the other country that was redacted from um, the leak. And I know WikiLeaks is threatening to release the name and there are issues with that. Um, I don't know, it'd yeah. be interesting to see what comes of it. I actually wanted to talk about the uh, redaction controversy. Somebody on Twitter, by their account, they said, Oh, 5.30 Central Time um, is, is, you know, exactly 72 hours. If WikiLeaks, who I like but are also, you know, totally self-aggrandizing at times, they threatened, if, if, if people in, in um, Internet land are not familiar with this, the Washington Post's version of this story, they redacted all the countries. It was basically, uh, I'm sorry, offhand, I absolutely can't remember the, the, the program names, but there's one... They were talking uh, metadata collection in, in Mexico, the Philippines, and Kenya. And then there's the Bahamas thing, which is actual phone content. And then there's the redacted other country, which is also full phone contact, uh, content being recorded. And the Washington Post redacted, I believe, all the country names. And the Intercept redacted one. And this is yet another reason why um, some radical lefties that I sort of read and half take seriously they're, they're obviously pissed at Greenwald now. 
Um, and WikiLeaks has threatened to release that name of whatever country that is if they have it. You guys have thoughts on redactions? I feel a little... The Intercept swore they had really good reason, but I feel uneasy about it. Do you guys have thoughts? Um, I mean, does it really... I, I guess it does matter to the actual people of the countries who, you know, the one that they're not releasing the name of. I mean, it, it literally could be anybody. I mean, if they're recording the Bahamas, it doesn't seem to be, like, something, anything to do with national security. It seems like it's just some random program that they're just throwing out there. So, I mean, as much as I'd like to know who that fifth country is, I kind of trust Glenn Greenwald's judgment on this. Um, yeah, I kind of do, but should he we? He seems to, in the past, have been pretty good about, you know, not overplaying his hand and kind of, you know, I trust him, but eventually it's going to come out anyway, so I'm not sure why, you know, if WikiLeaks has this information, why Glenn Greenwald himself and The Intercept don't want to release it. Which if they it know. said it would literally endanger people's lives. Right. And yeah. political unrest in the country mm -hmm. or something like that, yeah. Uh, Resident Kami, Corey, do you have thoughts on this? Um, I don't know. It seems a little suspicious to me. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm not as uh, automatically trustworthy of him. I mean, it seems like that that might be a fair assessment. That, like, he thinks it will like endanger people's lives, but um, I don't know. If he's got the information, then I, I would prefer it just be out there rather than just in the hands of, uh, of a few people. It, it seems very suspicious. Yeah, I think if... Um... If Glenn was worried about the political implications of revealing the name of this particular country, I think they should have gone ahead and done a Washington Post thing and just redacted all the names instead of causing now this, you know, these questions to come up. I mean, WikiLeaks would have probably still had a problem with it if all the names were, were censored. Um, but, I mean, I don't see harm in if he had kept it simply, you know, country A, country B, full content uh, is acquired. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm glad to know the names of these countries. The Bahamas thing yeah. really just gave me a chill because I think some of the subtext that they were trying to Greenwald and the co-writers whom I'm blanking on um, the the phone like the recording and the, the technology that allows the NSA to do this now. The implication in this piece was that the Bahamas was kind of good practice because I mean I don't know. I'm not making that up. It was sort of subtle, but like it's it's they're practicing this ability on a small country, a country that has 375,000 people in it, and, and for that trafficking purposes, I think it mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's no terrorism related thing. There's no national security issues. There's you know, terrorists aren't coming from the Bahamas to blow up the New York skyline. I mean it. Really, it's just kind of like, hey, we're going to do this because we can, we're going to practice, and we don't really need a reason to. We're just going to go ahead and, you know, start the recording. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, the D they, they, they went in under a legal DEA cover, and the DEA has been basically a spy agency for decades. I mean, they can um, and that's anyone, any yeah. country in the world, up DEA activity. It's, it's really bad. Like, as much as um, I'm keen on the whole stopping the NSA thing, I was writing a thing today for Rare about how, um, you know, like, like we had, like we, and there's another lefty critiques that are excessive of Greenwald, but there's some good points in there, and one of them is that it, we gotta remember it's not just the NSA. I wish it were, but it's not. That so that's disturbing. Um, I don't know, maybe, um, uh, Corey, do you have any other thoughts on this? Call me. Call me. Um, yeah, I don't know, I. It, it, it seems like uh, it's nothing to be surprised about. I mean, I don't know. It, 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 like, it's a leak, and I'm sure, like, some people in the United States are going to be, like, it's going to be the top of their list of things they're, you know, kind of, like, like, now worried about. Like, oh, now the government, you know, what else are they doing? And they should probably be thinking this all along. So it's it's not particularly surprising. So I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what other stuff, like, he is going to uh, let out soon. So I'm kind of wondering if that's going to be, like, I don't consider this, Particularly significant. So I'm wondering if this other stuff is going to be very significant. I, I mean, there's there's sort of the cheap but totally legitimate um, 
suggestions that Grimwald's done where he says that he has like a grand finale type thing and is like sort of I get why people are bothered by like the slow leak but I honestly think it's doing a good job in keeping it in people's minds like the average non-libertarians in the universe keeping it in, their, in, in you know headlines and in minds he's a showman I mean he, he has a little pizzazz that's not the worst thing in the world no. better than that than you know the dry documentary style just hear the facts blah 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 you know he is keeping people on their toes maybe he's just teasing that fifth country maybe he's going to reveal it in some big celebration maybe he'll reveal it with edward snowden when he has an uh, interview with brian williams mm -hmm. when do you know when that's supposed to air uh next wednesday i think okay I mean, um play devil's advocate you know information doesn't kill people WikiLeaks, you know, chooses to release this name. I mean, it's all up to what people do with that information. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's the pure that's the pure response, right? Information yeah. doesn't pull a trigger or drop a bomb. And if they're doing it with our money and in our name, I don't know what, if anything, even with my minarchist hat on, like what we shouldn't know. Um, I'd like to know what that country is. Even if WikiLeaks and their Assange self-aggrandizing manner. Yeah. I don't know how they'd get it exactly. Like I, I, I want to know. I just want to know. I, I also want to know. And me saying they should have or that Greenwald should have redacted the names was really just more of a, like to avoid the questioning. I, I also would like to know mm -hmm. who the fifth country is. You guys are nosy. <laughs> We're women. <laughs> just gossiping, you know. Yeah. Um. I guess I mentioned, you know, more distressing this with the Justin Amash uh, voting no on his own co-sponsored bill. Do we have any additional depressed thoughts about that? Now that it's more than the NSA, but we can't even stop the NSA. <laughs> Whew, that's not good. Politics as usual, I mean. I know, it is. I forget but... who the, the original sponsor, original writer of the bill was. I know Amash was you know, the co-sponsor or whatever. Wasn't it that douche who wrote the Patriot Act and then was like, whoa, guys, whoa. Is that who? I don't know. Somebody should look this up. But... I mean, it has the same terrible name, right? Like um, USA Freedom and Freedom yeah. spells out stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's how you know it's it's... Acronyms. Yeah, that's the one, acronyms. That's how you know it's like just a complete circus and a complete charade. They like, mm -hmm. name the bills in ways that like sound, like, like, sound cool to people. That's how you know it's a joke. <laughs> the kids love acronyms, Corin. Right? There, there should be a, a bill to outlaw bills with acronyms in their names. Oh, uh, there should be so many bills. Of, like, the uh, old Stossel standby, you can't pass legislation unless you repeal, like, three different laws. Or, f fuck, even um, Crazy McPizza guy election 2012. Oh, Lord. Crazy guy. I literally all can say oh, God. Ren is the uh, high guy? No, like um, legitimate pizza industry man who was like... Oh, uh, Herman, uh, uh, Herman Cain. Herman wow, Cain, yeah. that was right out of my head. Even he once suggested like bills can't be more than a page. I say any gimmicky stuff like that, I, I'm down with that, honestly. The gimmicky names like bring this file to my... They remind me of uh, like Chinese takeout drinks, like number one super Chinese takeout <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> this is what these pills are. <laughs> it's Yeah, those are always so optimistic sounding um, with their sort of endearingly skewed English. Um, yeah. kind of. I'm glad we can laugh while the country crashes around us. It's, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> me too! Um, okay. We're, that's that's eating up our time, but uh, you know it's also really important stuff. But um, another thing that I wrote about self-aggrandizing, but you know I I am the dictator slash host of this show. So um, do you guys have any thoughts about the 9/11 museum and particularly uh, some people? The New York Post, which is you know a crap. Uh, publication, but apparently actual family members of 9/11 survivors were kind of mad at the tackiness, like of just the very existence of a gift shop. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? Did you read the piece? Yeah, I I read... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't. Uh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't read anything about it except uh, a friend of mine, uh, Juliana, who lives in New York. I read a little bit of her thoughts about it. 
she was uh, she was furious at it. She was first very upset that it seemed like another. Uh, it was just like a commercialization of the tragedy that they're like the gift shop. Is, they're just trying to make some money. It is, there's no meaning behind what they're trying to do. Which I guess I don't know. It's I don't have a problem with people making money, but it does strike you as a little. Uh, uh, inappropriate, I guess. Uh, and the second reason she was furious about it was, I mean, because uh, we have we had this uh, this memorial for uh, the people who died in the U.S. and uh, it's completely ignoring the lar even larger amount of people that have died overseas because of U.S. military actions in response to 9/11. Well, of course it is, but I mean, yeah. I will say that the capitalism aspect. I, I get that if somebody you love died, that that would offend you. But, I mean, that's, there's so much, there's hundreds of millions of tax dollars making that museum that is not going to offer the nuance. And it's not going to mention, by the way, 200,000 Iraqis are also dead. I mean, like, what did they expect? The gift shop is the least of the offensiveness in some ways. Right, it's like, what's, compare, gift shop, millions dead, in you know, Iraq, <laughs> blah, blah, you know. And it's, it's tacky capitalism, but... Mm -hmm. I mean, did anyone really expect them not to have a gift shop? I mean, it's it's New York. There's a thousand vendors outside selling Remember 9-11 and, you know, I Heart New York stuff. I mean, they probably could have... I haven't literally seen every individual item, but I'm sure that borders on inappropriate tackiness for a lot of the things. But, you know, what are you going to do? Capitalism, baby. Plus, I mean, they're trying to make some of their operating costs back with merchandise. And this thing is really expensive. It's, it, it's supposed to cost $64 million a year, including $10 million in security. Better have a gift shop then. Yeah. I know. It sounds bad, but it really better. <laughs> right. Either that 9 or 11, 11 commemorative items have been on sale since September 12th. Like, it, this is not unprecedented. Mm -hmm. um, and people like to show solidarity or, you know, commemorate a tragic event, you know, through purchasing t-shirts and keychains. I mean, you, you saw it with the Boston Marathon, um, and that wasn't something that was, like, a calculated decision. Like, the Boston Strong stuff wasn't a calculated decision on behalf of, like, Nike and Adidas. Like, this came out of, like, hashtags on Twitter and people on the scene who, you know, felt like this would be a good way to, um, you know, get it out there. Um, I thought the biggest issue with the 9-11 Museum was, like, I think the remains, the yes, yeah. of people. So I don't. I feel like this is kind of like a, a messaging problem. Like, do you have issues with the gift shop, or do you have an issue with like the fact that there are still remains there? I don't know how to wrap my head around it. Yeah, I mean the remains thing is obviously worse, um, but at the same time. I mean, and there was also, I mean, there were also, when they cleared out the site, um, like nine months or a year after 9-11, you know, there's going to be remains of people in there as well. And I'm, you know, I'm really down with respecting the dead, even though I'm not religious. Like, I think it's important. But there's a point where you, how much, how many resources can you expend trying to just pick out bits of humans? And when you have, you know, a couple thousand pieces of unidentified people, the best DNA can't can't identify them. The museum part is weird, but they're putting them somewhere. The public's not going to be in the room where there's sort of a mausoleum scenario. Again, it's something that if I don't know what else they were going to do with them. There's there's nothing, you know. You the could divide. Shop. Go the on. Joe. That's just an easy target, basically. It's the yeah. most obvious kind of thing. You know, you you can't really speak about the foreign policy aspect and, you know, you can talk about the remains part, but, you know, this little gift shop is always going to bear the brunt of the, just because it's an easy target and it's capitalism and it's dirty, but it's no, you know, not nearly as dirty as the U.S. government, but, you know, what do you That's it. Do? I'm sorry, I wanted to write that quote somewhere, <laughs> put it somewhere. That was very good. Thank you. Um... um Though kind of a downer inherently, of course. Um, about 9/11, so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was bad. Turns out. I think we should probably move our butts in terms of progress here. Um, I had thought about talking about Chris Christie, and we should spend literally seconds on that. I think. <laughs> um, because Chris Christie is. He's not worth it. He's not worth it. It's not worth it. 
um, he did a speech recently, and it felt, you know, it was like the Marco Rubio speech like three years ago, where he just pandered about nation building. And I don't want to play, I'm sure Rand Paul will do something I hate sometime very soon, like tomorrow. But the difference between somebody like Chris, Christy talking and someone like Rand Paul, Rand Paul, you know, is still redeemable because he's pushed on issues. He's pushed. He hasn't just pandered. He's actually pushed. And that's the difference. Um, with, that, 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 that remains the difference with, with him in spite of some, some selling out isms. Thoughts on that? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. No, I, I, um, I guess I okay, almost like. All right. Chris Christie, you know, he's <laughs> going for that. He's playing a politician. He is a politician. He's going for the vote that still thinks America should be number one. You know, the, the Bill Crystal fans, the Weekly Standard people who want America to be the policeman in the world. So he's going for that, you know, demographic because he's not. You know, he hasn't really showed enough of conservative, his conservative side to, you know, the social conservatives, and you know, he's mm. all chummy with Obama. So really, all he has left is the, you know, U.S. number one policeman forever kind of, you know, vote. Talking so he's, points. He's going to go hard for that, and he probably mm. really thinks that because he's a fat turd, so. <laughs> oh, God. That's, that's all right. I knew, I knew that could happen when I signed up for the show. Um I don't know what that means. Does anyone else have any words on Chris Christie? Or should we move on to things that are not politics that we love? Which, let's do that. Let's do that. All right. Things that are not politics, which is everything good and pure and wonderful in the world, though also, I guess, like a serial killer, and that's bad. But um, I'm going to ask about sports. Though first, Corey, do you have something to tell us about what you like? That is not politics. Yes, Please. Godzilla, the movie, it was amazing. Yeah! <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, no, the movie was good. Uh, everyone should go see it multiple times. Uh, just uh, ignore the middle part of the movie because uh, it's, like, completely, like, glorifying the military, and there's, like, no Godzilla in the middle. And I actually hear the military had a role in producing the middle part. And it just looks like I'm like that. So the, the middle part sucks. The rest of the movie's really good. Oh, we can't talk about this because the wrong section, but yeah, the military has a lot of parts in a lot of movies, and that's terrible. But this is not politics. This is Godzilla. We like Godzilla. Also, Michelle and Joe are dying to talk about sports, and um, one of them, I, can t I can't tell the difference because they look so similar, said that libertarians don't tend to like sports, which sort of gels with my understanding of things, but not entirely. I guess... Is that true? Let's let's let's, op let's open up that question. And I also, can. why is do libertarians hate sports, and why are sports awesome? You libertarians. Let's let's try that. Gen generally, yes, we hate sports. <laughs> okay, not not Corey. <laughs> I I may have been the one who said libertarians hate sports, you know, as a question, because I don't know. It it kind of seems like. They don't like sports. Maybe it's because sports ties into the whole nationalistic thing. Or maybe it's because it's too, you know. Organized? Yeah, organized. I don't know. It, it seems from following libertarians on, you know, social media that not a lot of them talk about sports in any manner, and they seem completely uninterested in that. And that's why Libertarian Party is no good, because we don't have anybody who likes normal things, and they'd rather wear. <laughs> Guy Fox masks. <laughs> That's sort of <laughs> true. Uh, Michelle, why do you what, what what do you like about sports? Uh, a lot of things. I mean, just and a lot of things. Well, just kind of to bring this in with libertarianism. Like, I understand the bread and circuses types, the distraction that sports can pose, um, and those that feel that sports serve as like a platform for uh, a powerful tool of like root nationalism and promoting that, but sports aren't the only platform, you know, governments use to insert their politics, and so I don't know why libertarians, at least the ones I talk to, tend to hate specifically on sports, um, and I think libertarians should embrace sports and like sports, it, it, these franchises and these teams came about because of an entrepreneurial spirit, like someone 
thought one day, hey, like, people love, you know, this. Why not bring it together? And I know there are a lot of issues. Um, stadium today. welfare and yeah, such. Yeah. yeah, stadium subsidies, all that. Um, but if governments and, you know, can use sports as a platform to spread their ideas, I mean, we can, the public can use it as a powerful tool to work against that. And, we, and that's why I like sports. I mean, well, I like sports for various reasons. Um, but, you know, not only just the entrepreneurial spirit of things, um, but just focusing on the individual. Um, I know the Olympics get a lot of hate because it's like, oh, you know, China is like a beacon of human rights violations. Like this is, you know, why are we, why are we paying attention to these, these sports? We should boycott them. But at the same time, a lot of great things have come out of sporting events. I mean, we have a, what was it the Black Power salute during one of the Olympics? I mean, oh, we yeah. can use it Classic. as a platform to like shed light on, you know, the human experience and liberty and individualism and the power of people to overcome um, just the horrible things that governments do and they plenty to watch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, honest, I don't really like sports because my family is so sports-ish, but I've been to hockey games and I've enjoyed them and stuff. And what disturbs me more than anything on the earth is when the political reporters, and I could name names, and most of them are lovely people. They're like people like Dave Weigel or my friend Garrett, who <laughs> I did name names, um, who start treating politics like sports. And sports doesn't deserve that, and politics doesn't deserve that, because politics kills people, and sports is a game. And it has, you know, whispers, as Michelle mentioned, of, you know, stadium welfare and. I don't know, like uh, military salutes at a s sporting event or something, but it's, I mean, I do think in, in, in an ideal world, like, there'd be, sports are good, sports are voluntary, like, they're, they're competition, they're fun competition, in spite of that soccer war in South America that one time, <laughs> they're usually not, you know, wars. Yeah. I don't know, Joe, do you have yeah. more? I'm, I'm winning it here on sports. <laughs> <laughs> well, you shouldn't be talking about sports at all. I agree. I'm the host, though. But, you know, like almost everything else, the problem with sports arises when sports and government, you know, intermingle a little too, you know, too much. You know, when sports, sports had plenty of good things, you know, integration, all this other stuff, you know, the, you know, the black baseball leagues were, started by black business owners and, you know, it was kind of a way for them to, you know, do that entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, with the Olympics in Russia, would anyone really have known about all the, you know, gay rights violations if it kind of wasn't thrust into the, the spotlight by the Olympics? That's true. You know, and people that define gave, that, yeah. It gave mm -hmm. the Russian athletes, you know, kind of a, a platform to speak out against Putin and the, the terrible policies that he has this and you know it's obviously you're gonna have a mix of good and bad but you know sports for me is something it's not about politics it's not about libertarianism it's completely something else a diversion you know the way it's supposed to be mm -hmm. you know, sometimes i just don't care about thin and thick libertarianism <laughs> i just want to watch a ball game you're a terrible libertarian. To be a real libertarian, you have to find <laughs> libertarianness in everything. That's every true. Movie, every That's book, true. every single thing that you enjoy. There has to be an aspect of libertarian. So I'm, <laughs> I'm all in favor of kicking you out of the movement. That is not <laughs> All right, Corey, down. simmer down. I'm out. Stop I'm out. this divisiveness, Corey. We'll come over there, wherever you live, Florida. I quit, I quit the movement. I'm out. Right, you quit all the time. I'm joining God. a sport. I'll mute you all. I'll mute you all. All right. We all failed horribly in making a segment that is not about politics, um, and you should all be ashamed of yourselves for that. However, there was also some, that was a good segment, and there was very interesting. And that comes back to, Joe touched on the fundamental conflicts between, you know, I want people in the world to ignore politics and live their lives, but if we do that, if we do that, if anybody does that, politics is still out there killing people, so that's kind of a bummer. I have been enjoying catching up on Mad Men, Game of Thrones incessantly, and the Cars and Prince on Spotify a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't listened to Prince much. 
I have listened to my old boss cover Purple Rain, and that's weird. So now it sounds like Prince is covering Matt Welsh, and that's just not right at all. Not at all. All right, we are not yet concise, ladies and gentlemen, but that's okay. Um, hopefully you kept watching this when it appears on YouTube later in life. Someday we'll go live, ladies and gentlemen, I promise. Um, before we wrap up this evening, if we have, I don't know, more thoughts are good, but that's a little too open-ended. I don't trust you guys yet as a panel. Um, Corey, are you working on anything writing-wise? What have you done? Give us uh, some self-promotion. Yeah. Uh, Self-promotion, okay. Um, uh, the May edition of the New Leveler uh, just came out, which you can find on the Center for State Society website. The New Leveler is an individualist anarchist newsletter um, being run by Students for State Society. So uh, go check that out. Shiny. Uh, you, are you doing anything exciting in no. your life? <laughs> I work. You do work. We know that. I have a job, so that's tough to be part of the movement. We'll bring you in someday, As and then you'll become much lower paid, probably. I just want, I just want Twitter followers. <laughs> oh, Lord. Michelle, what have you got for us? Life? Promote your life or your works, anything. Just, just lay it on me here. Back to the sports thing for a second. Um, <laughs> All right, good. watching the Dogecoin car uh, in NASCAR, like making its way. I'm enjoying people. Wow. Uh, NASCAR fans learning about cryptocurrency. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. So that's what I'm enjoying right now. Sports are good. Maybe. I'll work on that. We'll have another panel in four months, and we'll see if I'm a, I'm a pod, a sporty pod person yet. Oh, Lord, we ran long. We're not concise. This Red Bull will help. This is not sponsored by Red Bull. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Corey, Joe, Michelle, Thank you so much for joining us, me, um, tonight. Um, I hope that you, future audience, enjoyed this podcast. And um, you can catch my stuff on Rare, Anti-War, and Vice, and, of course, the stagblog.com, where Joe and I both work on stuff. Um, thanks for coming, guys. I think we're out of time. Bye.